Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, hopefully this is all going well. Uh, if you want to throw something in the chat, just let me know that I can. you can hear me. That is always helpful. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about our threat report that we just put out, which you can find in the attachment section as well. Um, it's really a you know, big focus here is about how we secure the software supply chain. Um, but I'm really going to delve in a little bit more in depth with the findings from that uh, threat report like I just mentioned. And again, if you don't have a copy of it already, that's actually in the attachments section of the talk. All right, so what are the kind of big categories we're going to be talking about? Um, software supply chain covers a whole lot. Um, obviously, your software that you make is made up of everything you write, everything you consume from open source, everything you purchase and repackage as third-party components, um, and a whole bunch of variances in between, like code from other groups inside of your company, so-called inner source. Um, but what we're really going to focus on is the supply chain threats. And most of those are external, um, not internal threats. And they mostly cluster around open source and the packages that you're pulling in. And I should just note too that, you know, please, if you have any questions, please feel free to just throw them in the uh, chat. I'm absolutely glad to answer anything. So why are we talking about these though? Uh, and what's the kind of big takeaways from our threat report? So first, it's important to realize that any business that's app driven, which is effectively every business nowadays, um, has significant risk that is being presented through their supply chain. This risk isn't staying stable or unfortunately it's not declining. It is increasing. And there's a few reasons for that. One is that there's just more of it. There's more open source. There's more vulnerabilities in open source. People are disclosing more. Um, so there is more risk because there's more complexity um, and more scale. There is also, however, a greater sophistication in threat actors. Um, I'll talk about that a lot with the malicious packages uh, portion. But fundamentally, these, what used to be relatively simple typo squatting attacks, for example, are becoming much more complex and much more sophisticated uh, which makes them harder to prevent um, and actually makes them present much greater risk. And then there's less clarity about what you have. And again, this is a direct result of the complexity inside of your application. Applications are becoming increasingly complex, especially as we move towards things like cloud native, where you're inherently having a distributed system that is reusing a lot of components. I'll throw one other piece on that, which is that generally speaking, people are tending to solidify on certain, uh, let's call them libraries or packages to solve a single problem. Uh, so log4j is the easy example here. Everybody was using it. Um, and there's more and more of those packages that seem to be just used everywhere, that consolidation. So. What this all leads to is a remediation gap. You have more problems, you have the same resources to fix those problems, and now there is a gap between the, pro the risks that are present and your ability to remediate those risks. And then I'm really gonna focus on the malicious package aspect here because it's just an interesting growing challenge uh, that we have a lot of insights on. Okay, so. Uh, this is an interesting one. I want to kind of delve in for a second here on something I said earlier, which is that open source software um, is having more and more vulnerabilities. There's a lot of reasons for this. Um, our numbers are showing that it was about 25% growth rate from 2020 to 2021, and about a 33% growth rate from 2021 to 2022. Don't know how I messed that up. Anyways, that's how time works. Years come after each other. So fundamentally, um, there's a few drivers behind this. One is simply there's more open source. Uh, it really, open source doesn't really go away. It's always aggregating. 
it's always, every time somebody creates a new one, it's plus one. It's not, you know, a zero sum game. Um, but on top of that, more bugs are being discovered thanks to automation tools, but also really people are more willing to disclose them and more able to disclose them in a way that is shareable with the world. Um, this is leading to a giant uptick in the number of open source vulnerabilities. And, you know, I, I always, you know, throw a grain of salt on month to month data. Um, but what you can see here is that it's not evenly distributed either. Um, Someone usually, you see a large chunk of things happen um, at once. Large amounts of open source vulnerabilities get dropped at a single go. Sometimes this is a bad release from a major con, you know, a major, uh, I shouldn't say bad release, that's not fair. Uh, a release that fixes a lot of uh, vulnerabilities um, from major open source vendors. Right? You know, Red Hat or Android drops a big update with a whole bunch of security fixes. The number of vulnerabilities goes up because people only disclose vulnerabilities that are fixed. Um, but it does tend to be pretty noisy month to month with big jumps forward. But overall, what we saw was a big trend upwards in 2022. I should be clear, by the way, this is the month to month growth. So what this says is that, you know, from December of 2021 to January of 2022, uh, there was 57% more vulnerabilities disclosed. Now the combination of this um, leads to new holes. Now there's a lot going on here and I'm, I'm gonna try to sort of put this in bigger context here. Um, but you can see we grouped it together and you can see a very clear trend line going from the bottom left to the top right. This isn't hard to see, doesn't require advanced math here. Um, there is always more vulnerabilities being disclosed. This is getting to the point of sheer just inability to manage. There's too many. Um, with a thousand or so drop in every month, there's just a lot coming in. So forget growth rates for a second. The absolute number of known vulnerabilities is getting a little bit out of hand. And I'm gonna spend some time on this slide here. So. This is a really, I'm going to say, fundamental insight from our, our threat report, uh, which again, it's in the attachments. What we have here is a comparison of data we collected in the first nine months of the year um, about how long it took for people to fix problems once they were detected and what percentage of problems they were even fixing. And this matches what I think maybe a lot of the audience would uh, recognize. When I'm getting a thousand new vulnerabilities a month or whatever it is, depending on how much code you have, um, you know, but a significant amount, right? Remember I said 33% average growth rate over the year, that's a lot. Um, and I am only fixing 13% of the vulnerabilities I have I am losing ground. More importantly, the time it takes for a vulnerability to be fixed is pretty much exactly equal to your attack window. Hey, I have a known vulnerability, and if it takes me 271 days to fix that, well, then I have some real holes. I'm going almost, you know, what, three quarters of a year? Um, three quarters of a year without having a fix for a known vulnerability, I mean, who says it's okay to leave your door unlocked three quarters of the time you're not home? That's not a good idea. Um, that huge window and that very low percent means that you're keeping a, just say, avenue, a vulnerability, a weakness in your code for too long, and you're increasingly getting more and more so this problem keeps compounding. As long as your remediation percentage is less than the percent growth of vulnerabilities in your code, 
you will always have be gaining vulnerabilities. But what we did see on the bright side is that people who sort of followed our main way of recommending fixing this, which is through our repo integration, um, saw a much, much higher percent remediated. As a matter of fact, higher than the growth rate. And again, this is all average, right? Any given code base could obviously have a higher or lower growth rate of vulnerabilities, depending on things like how old it is and what language it's in. But um, you know, on average, across the whole industry, and this is a relatively huge sample size, what we see is that if you are remediating inside the repository, you are actually not just keeping pace with the pace of new vulnerabilities, but actually gaining a little bit. And the average number of days is hugely much. It's, I mean, that's ridiculously less. It goes from basically, what, nine months to two and a half. So that means you've got less of a window of opportunity and you're actually gaining and reducing the risk in your application. Um, I should talk a little bit about here, um, you know, without doing the math, time to remediation cut by 75% and three times reduction of the risk. So you guys can read. But fundamentally, the how here matters. The reason for this giant jump is because if you're doing something like pipeline scanning, where you're building it and then you're creating a scan, you're getting a whole bunch of results of known vulnerabilities. And then you're saying, okay, I'm going to prioritize those. We'll take everything that's I'm a critical and high. Developers, please go fix those. And then by the time they get it, 30 days have already gone past. Uh, by the time they actually look at it, another 30 days have gone past. Then they've got to fix it, put it in the code, got to put it back in a new build, which you might not, may or may not happen right away. Uh, then that build's got to get scanned. And now you're like, oh, good, that, that vulnerability is remediated. It's really no wonder it takes forever. And it's certainly, because of all that time lag, the, the remediation percent, the amount of vulnerabilities that are getting closed is pretty low. Each time you do this, you end up saying, developers, there is a new vulnerability you need to go fix. And then they have to go and research it and then actually update their code. Um, when we talk about the repo integration, um, this is something that we you know, feel is the best way to centralize your risk mitigation. What we do is every time you make a commit, it scans it, sees what's in it, says, hey, you've got a couple of vulnerabilities here. And instead of just telling you about the findings, we'll create a pull request for you to update to the right version, click the merge button. Now, that's a lot easier and it's a lot faster. Interestingly, the average number of days to fix a vulnerability isn't a nice clean average at 70. It's actually weighted very highly on either end. Lots and lots and lots of people just doing it instantly. Why not? Just create a pull request, click merge, let's move on. You know, I was on version one, it's vulnerable. It's asking me to go to version 1.01, .01. fine, no problem. But, uh, this is where this sort of starts coming into what we call functional risk. So again, I'll take that example and it's why it's sometimes 70 days. Perhaps I'm on version one and the latest version is version seven. Well, now I have to make some considerations that aren't just security. I have to think, boy, if I jump six versions, what breaks? By the way, not what will something break, what breaks, something will break. Um, it's a function of a couple of things, but fundamentally it's a function of what I would call debt, um, aging components. There's a lot, if you have a lot of old components, it becomes harder to update them. It is easier to go from version 6.8 to 6.9 than it is to go from version two to version 6.9. And so people end up having to make these trade-offs. So oh, I should break a cardinal rule of slides and go back. Um, people end up having to make these trade-offs. And that's why we see a lot of people are with, you know, sure, no problem, let's merge that in, great. I'm pretty confident it'll work. 
uh, you know, it's a minor version change. And a whole lot of other people going, well, boy, I better make sure this is, I know what effect this is going to have. Or maybe I'll try the update in a sandbox somewhere and see what breaks. And so now it's just taking me another two months to fix that problem. I shouldn't say fix that problem. Remediate the vulnerability and then fix all the relating functional problems. And look, this stuff sucks up time and resources, which is why the remediation percent when you have to do everything manually is so low. And with basically the same resources, just better tooling and a better approach, you end up with a much higher remediation percent. All right, so what does this sort of, oh, whoops, I'm jumping around too much. I threw my own cadence off by jumping backwards. It's not good. Okay, so forgive me. Uh, you can put in the comments uh, how annoying that was. Um, look, the other big piece here is you don't get granular information. It can be hard to know what functional risk you're actually introducing. Um, sometimes it's the end of the world to jump from version one to version two. Sometimes it doesn't matter at all. And trying to apply blatant rules like major version changes require X and minor is a blunt force instrument. It's not a very clean way to do it. And this is what I mean by granular information. I need to know not just whether or not there's a vulnerability in a fix um, inside of a given version. I need to know what the consequences of moving to that version are, including the functional risk, including additional security risks that can happen. Um, and very importantly, I need to have some level of confidence before I just accept a merge, a pull request and merge it in. And so, you know, one of the reasons that this percentage has gone so much higher uh, is because one of the things we do inside that repo integration uh, is actually provide a what we call merge confidence score that tells you whether or not, well, frankly, how recent the update was. You know, has this been out for a minute or has it been out for three years? Um, three years is more stable, uh, as well as has other people who've adopted this exact change had problems. Have they failed their builds? Have their functional tests failed? What's the confidence that this fix recommendation is good and not going to introduce more functional risk? All right. So I'm going to pivot now and talk about some malicious packages. So first, I'm going to define what a malicious package is, because it sounds like something FedEx is giving you, but it is not. Um, this is a open source library very often, but any kind of package that you're pulling down from one of those central repositories, at Maven, NPM, one of those. And look, most of these, perfectly fine. Nice and safe to go put in your code. Some of them are not. They're intentionally vulnerable. So now I'm not talking about known vulnerabilities where you know the open source maintainer says, whoops, we had a problem, we fixed it, use this you know, version and it's, it's fixed now, thank you. Uh, this is things that were intentionally put in there to be a vulnerability by a bad actor, either in a existing open source framework, uh, open source library, or um, perhaps they create one that looks like one uh, that's well known. I don't know. Instead of log for J, it's log five J, and you pull it in because you accidentally hit the five, and now suddenly you've opened a back door in your code. These are harder to handle and detect because they aren't actually a known vulnerability. So you can't correlate it to a whole bunch of different data sources and you know find it. These are hidden. But they have patterns to them. And when the packages get pushed to these central repositories, they're available for scanning. And so the, what we've done is we've actually put together one heck of a nice AI-driven, pretty cool system uh, that monitors all of these and flags packages that are malicious. 
So we have a giant database of malicious packages. And this is where that data comes from. Uh, that's a product called Bin Supply Chain Defender. Um, I'm not selling anything. That happens to be a, a free tool. Um, that does one thing. It tells you whether or not a malicious package is present in your code. More accurately, it tells you whether or not you're about to introduce a malicious package into your code. Because unlike known vulnerabilities, malicious packages are an attack in and of themselves. This is stopping an obvious robber at the door. Importantly, this is not some dying trend. This is a new trend. This is the newness. Um, fundamentally, we're seeing huge amounts of and increasing amounts of malicious packages being introduced because they are a very effective attack vector. Um, you can see here, there's some interesting reasons and theories we have about why things cluster at like March and July. Um, and there's some fun geopolitical stuff that's involved in that as well. But um, what you see here is, you know, in a given month, there can be two to 3,000 um, malicious packages published in the world. And most of these are not, you know, they're not named malicious package 101. They look like something else, something valuable and something real that is safe. These are cuckoos in the nest. And it's increasing. There's some variability month to month, but you know, we aren't seeing this trend downwards. This trends upwards, and it's trending upwards very strongly. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna turn that off. I don't know what that was. Um, so as we talk about these malicious packages, there's some sophistication reasons um, that they're trending upwards as well. One is keep, it's important to keep in mind these things work. Bad actors like to do things that work. They don't, they aren't in the business of, you know, putting out intentionally easy to uh, block vulnerabilities and weaknesses. But the sophistication overall, especially in the open source community um, is increasing. So that gives a few more attack vectors that look more reasonable. So as an example, more and more legitimate packages actually include telemetry. Great. It's easy to disguise telemetry. If something's already, you already know, if, for instance, it's going to have traffic, it's easy to disguise some malicious traffic. It raises less red flags is really what I'm saying. Also, the sophistication of the vector, the actual attack itself, is getting interestingly deeper. They aren't doing it on these, you know, easy to log 5J is a, is a joke, uh, you know, typo squatting one. That's not a real one. That wouldn't really work. Um, but some package is calling a package is calling a package that's inside something else. That can fly under the radar pretty easily. They're also using real hosting providers now. Um, you know, these aren't, you know, some third world countries thing you've never heard of. This is sitting there straight in NPM. And then there's actually a lot of sophistication going into just making it look on the surface as real. You know, hiding behind actual domain names. There's one other one I didn't put on the slide, but I'll mention it. Um, there's also been a case, well, several cases, I should say, of perfectly fine packages suddenly becoming malicious. Um, things that have been safe for a while. You can trust them. They've been safe for two or three years. And then suddenly somebody somewhere makes a change, a new committer shows up, and there is a malicious package instead of it being a safe package. And it just flips overnight. So you can't just go, oh, well, is it new in NPM or not? Because the sophistication of this is pretty high. Um, there's even been some specific ones that, that do things like protest where, or target specific geographies where the package is perfectly safe. 
Um, we recently published one that actually, uh, you know, it, it's a protest where uh, if you were in Russia, it behaved differently than if you were not. So the vast majority of users of this open source package, no change. Um, but boy, do you really want to be using an open source package that will, let's say, target specific geographies? What if yours is next? What if you are in Russia and actually making this application and it's deleting things on you? Um, so it's a important thing to note that it's not just new packages. Sometimes it can be existing, even stable, even well-known packages. The benefit of open source is anybody can contribute. The downside of open source is anybody can contribute. Um, and it has to be maintained. And it's pretty easy to take your eye off the ball for a minute and have somebody make a malicious addition. So anyways, I'm just going to talk a little bit here. Um, I know you saw some of this data already, but this is 2022. Um, this is the number of versions, not just packages. Um, so you can see this is you know at 6,000 in July, almost 7,000 in August. Busy summer. Um, importantly, it's not just sometimes a package that's bad. It might be a specific version of a package. Um, maybe other ones are good. Like I said, you know, a new change to an old uh, and well-known uh, package. Um, so you can see that it's not just that we have more packages. It's actually that we have more versions of more packages, um, which is telling in and of itself, um, but also makes it really easy to, to, fall under, to fly under the radar. A lot of people are pulling it in with latest tags, for example, instead of saying an actual version they're pulling in. And some of these get pulled back very quickly, but that doesn't help you if you've already built your code. So I'll talk a little bit about a few of the types. I'm going to go into more detail into this into the actual report. Um, but, you know, typo squatting is my easy favorite example. Um, but it's actually beginning to fade off. It's not as effective anymore. Uh, there's ways to protect against it. Brand jacking, talked a little bit about that, right? It's, it's growing. It's definitely growing. The ones that are coming into play now in the last couple of years are really dependency hijacking and dependency confusion. Um, what I was talking about with, like, latest and things like that. These are the trending vectors. It's important to note, though, the old ones aren't going away. It's just that the bad actors are finding new ways. Um, they haven't really abandoned the old ways. So I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, I, I try to keep these to a half hour and get everybody's attention span. Uh, and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, but uh, you know, look, we all know this. Everybody who's listening to this knows everything's an application now. Everything runs on software. Um, I'm not entirely certain my chair doesn't have some software in it somewhere. Everything runs on software. It's the entire economy. It is all of manufacturing, all of medical applications and software run the world. Threat actors know this. Um, you know, Understanding and attacking infrastructure and software is what they do. They've been doing it in increasingly complex ways. There's more and more vulnerabilities that keep showing up. And those are the easy ones to protect against. And even then, our state of our industry is that people are actually gaining vulnerabilities in their code due to practices like pipeline scanning and manual fixes that are too slow. They're too slow and they're not cost efficient enough to do at scale. So the threat landscape is, I guess, increasing in volume, um, but also in innovation. Malicious packages were the thing that three years ago was barely on anybody's radar. And now it is a major attack vector that has to be protected against. Um, you know, it's not part of the threat report because it's retroactive. But there are new ones that are popping up. You know, threat actors are there to create problems, to open up holes, and they're getting innovative about it. So that means that in general, the status quo isn't really helping anybody. 
Um, if you're remediating 13% of the vulnerabilities that you have, and you're introducing 30% every year, you are falling behind. And nobody ever retires the old code. It just doesn't happen. So keeping things up to date is hard. And so you have to focus on applying the remediations and for making sure that you understand the balance between security and functional risk as you try to reduce the risk in the application. And that means you need good prioritization and remediation, not just tools, tools are important, but processes as well, right? You know, we support pipeline scanning, plenty of people use us for that. And our recommendation is don't do that as a process, put it in the repo, scan on commit, fix automatically. Not everybody's ready, but it's not just a tooling problem, it is a process problem. Um, on top of that, the tools obviously need to keep track of the new threats like malicious packages, which not everybody is doing, but that is also a process problem as well, right? It's always people, tools, and process. Um, but the big highlight for me in the threat report is that our processes and our tools aren't keeping up with the threat landscape. And that it is important as an industry that we both adopt tooling and processes that allow us to keep up better. So that's my summary of that. I will kind of leave it there and see if we have any questions. Pardon me while I flip through. Well, I don't see any direct, which could be my fault and not anybody of you. You could have even put questions in. Um, <laughs> could just be me uh, playing with the interface here, but I'll, I'll leave it here. Um, if we do get questions, I'm glad to answer them. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out to us with any questions as well. We're always happy to talk about this stuff. Um, and like I said, the threat report is in the attachments as well. I hope you give it a glance. There's a lot of inform information in there, uh, more than I would shove into a webinar and keep your attention for a half hour. Um, but you know, by all means, go through, dig through. And if you have questions from it, always reach out to us. We're happy to talk about the threat landscape. Thank you.